Hello and welcome to the latest edition of WVU Medicine Tuesday Talks. I'm your host, Mary Ravazio Menard. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but are you aware of the very latest diagnostics and treatments for breast cancer? Do you know when you should get your first mammogram or how to do a proper self-exam? We're going to find out the answers to those questions and more today as we're talking to Dr. Hannah Hazard Jenkins. She's director of the WVU Cancer Institute and a surgical oncologist. Welcome, Dr. Hannah Hazard <laughs> Jenkins. <laughs> we're getting off to a good start. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me. But yeah, Hannah's fine. Okay, it's great to have you thank here. Thank you very much. Now, we do encourage questions from our viewers. So if you have any questions, feel free to enter them on the comments section, your breast cancer questions, and we'll do our best to answer them live. So... Let's start first with breast cancer awareness. Um, I imagine early detection uh, for breast cancer is probably the best preventative measure we can take. So how often should we do a self-exam? So it, it's a great question. The self-exam, traditionally, we would talk about doing it monthly. Um, there are some out there that would say maybe not conscientiously doing it every single month. It has created a sense of what we call false positives, meaning that if you're going and looking for something, you may find it, which ultimately is benign or normal breast tissue. We also talk about it in the context of if you're washing yourself and something seems different, then that usually, that standout tends to be a little bit more um, accurate and leading to some sort of investigation. For my practice, women who've already had breast cancer, we certainly encourage them to be very conscientious of their breast health and their breast examinations. And that can be difficult um, after having surgery and radiation therapy. There's a new normal that sometimes it takes a little while for them to get uh, used to. But certainly being conscientious of you know, changes to your skin, changes to the contour of the breast or whether or not the nipples retracted, those are all important things that are really observation-based. So, And we should do that monthly? Yeah. I mean, you know, if you look at yourself in the mirror every day, you'll probably catch something. Um, as far as a concerted sort of effort, you know, monthly is probably fair. Weekly and daily are not at all indicated and will, you know, kind of drive you crazy. <laughs> um, but, you know, monthly would be a very reasonable mechanism to do that. Okay. And how old should we be when we get our first mammogram? So there's a little bit of controversy around that. Um, depends on whose guidelines you follow. We follow um, the yearly, starting at the age of 40. Now remember, that's for somebody with average risk. So um, average risk is somebody who doesn't have a genetic mutation that puts them at risk for early onset breast cancer. So we start at 40 for the average risk woman. For women who carry some of the higher risk genetic mutations, some of that screening actually starts at the age of 25. Wow. So for women who have BRCA or BRCA mutations, we actually start with MRIs at the age of 25 and we do those yearly. And then once they hit 30, then we add in mammograms. Okay. When you're young, the mammogram is a little less informative. Mammary tissue, which is, you know, normal breast tissue is very dense and, and appears white on a mammogram. Tumors are also dense, so they are white. Oh, wow. So there's that juxtaposition that, um, of two densities, so it's harder to find those. And so, again, women who are at increased risk of early onset breast cancer, we add the MRI because it's a different imaging modality from mammogram. But average risk person, 40, and once a year. And um, the 3D mammogram, yep. is that per pretty much part of the regular mammogram uh, routine now? Yeah, for the most part. Most centers have 3D mammography. It's called tomosynthesis. It's the next evolution in imaging. So when you get mammograms, the tomosynthesis or the 3D takes multiple images as it goes through the breast as opposed to one stationary image. And that allows the radiologist to be able to scroll through, scroll through the breast tissue to see where there may be some asymmetries or a mass that might be subtle that you wouldn't necessarily find on straight 2D mammography. So more effective than a 2D mammogram? Yes. Yeah, more effective than a 2D mammogram. Now, what about um, women with dense breasts? Mm -hmm. You were mentioning that earlier. 
Um, can you talk about the automated breast ultrasound yeah. and how does that work? So we know it's a little harder to find cancers in dense breast tissues. Some of that is rel related to age. Some of that is just sort of an innate characteristic of some women's breasts, no matter what their age is. And again, because you don't have the juxtaposition of fatty replaced breast tissue to solid masses, the guidelines are encouraging consideration for alternate screening methods. So the two alternate screening methods are breast MRI and then an automated breast ultrasound. And, and those what's be the for, difference with yeah. those two? Um, yeah, so these are for women who have on their mammogram, everybody's mammogram report has a measurement of density. It's a requirement. So for women who have either heterogeneously dense or extremely dense breasts, then these would be supplemental options. So an automated breast ultrasound, instead of the handheld paddle that a technologist rubs over an area or collects images over an area, it, <clears throat> this automated is a larger paddle, so to speak, um, okay. and it scrolls over the breast, somewhat similar to the 3D mammography where it's collecting multiple images. It takes out the um, user error or the potential for user interference. So if you miss a little area, if you're doing it by handheld, this acquires images um, throughout the entire breast. And so oh, wow. it, <clears throat> it supplements because it's looking for densities. Um, it's not good for calcifications. So that's a mammogram find for the most part, but this is a nice way to supplement and look at dense breast tissue. The alternative is MRI. Right. Um, Far more difficult, I think, and less comfortable for patients. Um, so not necessarily something that we jump to right away. Having said that, again, if you have a genetic mutation or your calculated risk, you know, at five years is elevated, then sometimes we would choose MRI over the automated breast ultrasound. Um, breast MRI, you actually lay on your belly. Um, oh. And so it acquires images, and then you also get a contrast called gadolinium, which helps us understand the blood flow of the breast. And so combining those sets of images, we're able to identify areas that may be a, of concern. They're very, it's a very sensitive test, but it loses some of the specificity. So in other words, it'll have a high false positive rate, more so than other tests. So that means that if you get an MRI and they find something, it doesn't necessarily automatically mean it's a cancer. And so you have to weigh the risks, benefits, not only in some of the physical risks as far as extra biopsies, but then also emotionally the anxiety that oh, yeah. a, a positive test will bring. So, you know, for the average woman, average risk, we talk to our patients about automated breast ultrasound. And then we just talk through the pros and the cons. It does have a little bit of a higher false positive rate. But once we talk through that, then it's a joint decision on whether or not to proceed with that supplemental screening. Um, is, is there one diagnostic tool that's preferred over the other? Or is it just like a case-by-case -case yeah. basis? It's know? a great question. So there's a difference in breast imaging between screening and diagnostic. Screening is for women who have zero problems, zero complaints, zero issues. For a diagnostic imaging, you can do mammogram, you can do ultrasound, and obviously MRI. Mammograms are really good for calcifications, so it's really the only place out of those three that you can identify calcifications. It's important to know that just because there are calcifications doesn't mean there's a cancer. So there are a whole host of reasons why you would have calcifications in the breast. And they run from benign things like fibrocystic changes, to a cancer, um, and usually it's on the earlier stage if you're identifying it through calcifications, which is why we do screening mammogram. So, um, so for calcifications or trying to find a breast cancer early, like DCIS, then you would, the preference is mammogram. If you find something on mammogram that's solid, you always do an ultrasound because you wanna determine whether or not it's solid, is it cystic, is it benign characteristics? Is it not? And then, and then you move from there. So it's a little bit case by case dependent, um, but each have their value in the grand scheme of things. So you, one doesn't necessarily trump. It's kind of putting the pieces of the puzzle together to right. come up with the best recommendation. And these are helpful if you have dense breasts. And that's that's is, having dense breasts. That's pretty common, isn't it? I would think it's pretty common. Um, it just depends on age and the people. You have to remember the population that I see in my clinic is a little bit different yeah. than the standard population sure. that comes through. So, but yes. 
yeah. it is not uncommon. Um, when you were talking earlier about, uh, you know, people with a history mm -hmm. of family history of, of cancer would have to start mammograms sooner. I think that there's a myth to be busted here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think, think you're right. a lot of people think, hey, I mean, I don't have any family history in, in you know, of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And some people would think, well, then, you know, I'm not at risk. Right. I think that's true. There, there are kind of two ways, two paths into breast cancer, so to speak. There's the ones that you inherit from your family. So those are sort of a, a hereditary risk. So those are those genetic mutations we talked about, BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, CHECK2. There are a couple of them that are put you at risk, increased risk. Those are by far the minority. To okay. identify someone who has that kind of genetic pattern is pretty rare. You will have people that have some family history. We just don't identify a gene probably because we don't know it yet. Um, but the majority, the vast majority, 80, 85 percent of the cancers that we get are what are called sporadic, which means there isn't a family history. This is just a sporadic breast cancer. And so it's nice not having a family history of breast cancer. Probably means you haven't inherited something that would generate it. But the vast majority of women uh, diagnosed with breast cancer, it's all sporadic. So they, it's, it's the vast majority don't have a family history. That's great. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's a big cool. myth, <laughs> definitely. It is. Um, so if you are diagnosed with mm -hmm. breast cancer, can you tell us about, like, what are the latest treatments now for breast cancer? So it's important to think about breast cancer kind of in two parameters. So there's treatment that has to be done that's local treatment, which means surgical resection, and sometimes also means radiation, and that depends on your surgical resection type and then sometimes your final pathology. And then there's systemic treatment, meaning how do we treat the whole body? And most women get some element of both. When you talk about um, new things in local treatment, which would be surgery and radiation therapy, there it's been an evolution that's relatively quick in the grand scheme of things for cancer care from you know modified radical mastectomies, well truthfully Halstead's mastectomy from a long time ago, but even more recently taking us from always having to have a mastectomy to having a lumpectomy, always having all of your lymph nodes taken out to a progression towards um, less and less. Yeah. So I think over time we're going to work me out of a job. <laughs> oh, let's hope so, huh? I'm a, <laughs> yep, exactly. I was, I was just about to say that and I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, so we are, right now, I think a lot of the literature and a lot of what's happening is trying to identify how much and which nodes or lymph nodes to take out in a variety of different settings. And so that's where, from a local perspective, we get a little bit of leeway and grace. Even women who present with lymph node involvement, if you give them chemo first, and those lymph nodes normalize. There are mechanisms, studies that tell us if you meet a certain set parameter, we could actually avoid the full lymph node dissection. Whereas, you know, five, 10 years ago, it would have been kind of an automatic that you would do the dissection. So you would like to avoid that if possible. Um, there's an increased risk of lymphedema, which is chronic arm swelling. There's an increased risk of sensory loss um, mm -hmm. in the back of the arm. The more nodes you take, the higher that risk is. So yeah, we're right. trying to move our way out of doing bigger surgeries. On a radiation standpoint, there's a lot that's coming through. Traditionally, if you'd have uh, a breast cancer, you would have a lumpectomy if you wanted that, and then you would follow it with radiation therapy, and that's whole breast radiation therapy. The radiation is really important to reduce the risk of local recurrence, so right. not having it come back in that breast. If you got a recurrence or a, what we call a new primary, meaning a completely different cancer, same breast, it used to be that you would do a mastectomy, and that's certainly the more common avenue, right. but there is data to support um, in certain circumstances, not everyone, but in certain circumstances where you could re-irradiate the breast but instead of re-irradiating the whole breast, you just re-irradiate the area where the, the area. that one area where you either have a recurrence or a new primary. Wow. And that gives women a little bit more option for breast preservation, which we didn't necessarily have 
Um, certainly, we do intraoperative radiation therapy first time around. So, if that's somebody's a IORT. IORT, that's correct. How does that one work? I remember it's got like this gold, <laughs> it's so, like little blanket. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so intraoperative radiation therapy is for certain t tumor types, so low grade small tumors. Um, and it, what happens is once the tumor is out, then we place the device. It's a, a conical device with a, a, a circular ball at the end of it that we place into the cavity that's created by taking out the tumor. And we make sure the breast tissue is wrapped around it so we sew it up. And then we make sure that we have enough thickness between the device and the skin so that we're not burning the skin. And as long as all those parameters are met, then we deliver radiation while the patient's still asleep in the OR. And it delivers radiation to about a centimeter around where the tumor used to be because we know that's where most recurrences happen. Oh, okay. So there are other mechanisms of partial breast radiation, so to mm -hmm. speak. Um, they're catheter-based ones. Um, so there are other options. Again, just sort of adding in some layers um, to preserve the breast sure. if, if that's what patients want to do. Yeah. And if you, if you want or need breast reconstruction yep. after any of these procedures, right. your insurance company has to cover that, right? So it's an important point. So if someone requires a mastectomy, wants a mastectomy, those are two different things. And that's a decision that happens between the patient and the surgeon. Um, then there's federal law that mandates that reconstruction is covered by your insurance company. And so it's an important point. Mm -hmm. um, it's also required to pay for what we call symmetrizing, symmetrizing procedures later on. So if you are a larger um, size cup um, and you get reconstruction with an implant and now you have one that's smaller, one oh, that's yeah. larger, one that's what we call totic versus not, then insurance would be required to pay for a procedure on the opposite breast to make it match the reconstructive bed. Yeah, so that, that's also required, um, which is an important point. And you can have that reconstructive surgery either like right away yeah. or you can that's wait. Right. That's correct. Yep. You know, a period of time after yeah. your procedure. You can certainly start, and we often will start reconstruction at the same time as the mastectomy. Um, very rarely is it all finished in one operation. It's usually a two-stage operation, but it can sometimes be finished in one stage, but that's pretty uncommon. But we will start that reconstruction um, at the same time as removing the breast. What about uh, breast cancer survival rates? Where do we stand? Is it getting better? Is it improving, staying the same? It, it certainly is. Um, we, so we are getting better and better, and it comes back to some of the question, the question you asked about sort of what's new. Um, the, the drugs that we give are becoming more and more specific and less and less um, one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Um, and we are beginning to understand who needs some of those systemic therapies and who doesn't need. And a lot of that has to do with this personalization of your care. And, and it has a lot to do with what is the biology or the makeup of your tumor, not just how big it is or whether or not it's in a lymph node, but from a molecular standpoint, is this an aggressive tumor? Is this not an aggressive tumor? And so instead of taking tumor size or lymph node status in some instances as the reason for chemotherapy, we can use molecular testing and that develop recurrent scores. So we understand what's the risk of it coming back somewhere else in the body. Because yeah. truthfully, while a recurrence in the breast is inconvenient and it is uh, emotionally exhausting, where yeah. you really don't want it to come back is somewhere else in the body, bone, liver, lung. And so the whole purpose of systemic therapy is to help us prevent that from happening. And so the medical oncologist will work through that process and that decision making. And, and so over time, we've become better and better at figuring out who really needs the chemotherapy and who doesn't. In addition, you know, immunotherapy is coming on the scene in a whole variety of different tumor subtypes, including breast cancer. And so you can look, there are certain patients that we know 
would have a benefit to immunotherapy um, based on new molecular testing that's being done. And so a lot of that's done through clinical trials, but some of it's also off trial because the trials have proven a benefit. So, um, so there's a lot that's happening and mm -hmm. a lot that's happening quickly. What about women that um, are at high risk, mm -hmm. you know, either have the, the BRCA or... Um, any of those other mutations? Yes, yep. know, the other mutations that um, decide to take a preemptive strike. I don't want to wait till I get breast cancer. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to, you know, have a mastectomy now. Yes. What are your thoughts on that? So that is a very personal decision. Um, it is also, so the average woman's risk is one in eight, which translates to about 12%. Women who carry some of these genetic mutations, their lifetime risk can be as high as 80%. Wow. So it's not a subtle difference in the risk of getting breast cancer. It's actually quite dramatic. Mm -hmm. So when we first identify somebody who has a mutation, um, who hasn't had a breast cancer, which is kind of ideally where we would like to be, we can offer them a variety of things. The, the least is just to change their screening. So instead of just starting with mammograms at 40, depending on their age, we would add in MRIs in that population. So the intent is you would catch it at an earlier stage right. as opposed to a little bit later stage with the intent of improving survival. Some women opt for that. Um, and then that's just their personal preference. Sometimes after a couple of years and having false positives, they get to a threshold of tolerance and say, mm. kind of uncle. Yeah. Um, it's all personal preference. So, right. you know, when, when you come to see a surgeon, you come to see somebody, that screening change is on the table as an option. The, you don't present as the only option is removing the breast. That's something that you have to be pretty comfortable with. Nobody's ever excited about it, but yeah. you have to be kind of at peace with that decision. Mm -hmm. And I certainly would encourage and, and do encourage women that get to that point that we would proceed because risk reduction in that situation takes them from 85% down to anywhere from five to 10% risk. It's not zero. Right. But it drops them substantially. Substantially, and then that way you've sort of preemptive strike um, mm -hmm. and prevent mm -hmm. that and prevent that breast cancer from developing. But I mean, it, it sounds like we have a lot more options, or at least more effective options and treatments. I mean, diagnostically and yeah. treatment-wise. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a rapidly moving field um, in the cancer world. So I often say, you know, when we train residents for surgery, it's a five-year residency. What I teach and talk about when the resident is a first-year resident and what we teach and talk about when they're a fifth-year resident is usually pretty different. Oh, so, wow. So in that course of five years... It changes that fast. There's a, there's a change both on the surgical side as well as on some of the systemic therapy side. So that's a good thing. Though. It's a great mm -hmm. thing. It yeah. can be really confusing for patients, right? Oh, so yeah. if you have all these options, mm -hmm. it can be hard. And so part of my job, our team's job, to be honest, because we, we're part of a big team, is to break down some of those decisions mm -hmm. to allow it to be compartmentalized to help sort of make those decisions. Um, in a constructed way. So, What about men in breast cancer? Men can get breast cancer, they, right? Yeah, they can. About 1% of all the breast cancers diagnosed each year are in men. Um, they tend to come in a little bit larger just because nobody really thinks about male sure. breast cancer. Um, but the, so a lot of the treatments are the same. Um, you would require a resection. There's really not a lot of data about breast conservation in men, so most right. of men with breast cancer would get a mastectomy. In that population, it's really important to do genetic testing because it's so rare. You want to make sure that there isn't a genetic predisposition to it, so that way you can monitor them afterwards. Sure. When you identify a genetic mutation, it's also important to know that everybody else in the family ideally would be notified because of the way that pattern of inheritance happens. And so once you identify a mutation, then letting everybody else know to test for it is important. Okay. Um, I know it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but really this, this is a year-round thing, right? It is a year-round thing. <laughs> it is a year-round thing. And, and I think it's important to understand that it is, it is one of 
quite a few ways. There are about four or five ways where we have effective screening. So part of this is about breast cancer screening, but it's also about you know self-help awareness and cancer prevention when possible. So, okay. Yeah. We have a question from one of our viewers. It says, I have a BRCA1 gene. What preventive treatment do you recommend? So great question. Um, this, again, is a really personal conversation. I think my first recommendation is to find somebody that can walk through all these options that you trust. For women with BRCA mutations, we definitely talk about changing their screening pattern. So if you aren't being screened by an MRI, you need to be screened by MRI. We stagger those. So for example, if you get your mammograms in January, you get mm -hmm. your MRIs in July. Okay, So there's sense. always imaging every six months. We also um, have a high risk clinic. That's just us personally. We're a little bit spoiled, but we have a high risk clinic. And the person that runs that high-risk clinic sees those patients every six months to do a physical exam, <clears throat> making sure that something hasn't cropped up. There are other mechanisms, sort of non-operative mechanisms of risk reduction. You can um, take an anti-hormone pill, probably a little less effective for BRCA1, but still an option. Ovary removal um, after a certain age is also a risk reduction um, for patients who have some of these genetic mutations. Speaking of changes, there's some, there's some, there's a trial that's looking at is it the ovary you need to remove in this situation or is it just the tubes? So oh. there's actually a clinical trial because there are benefits to having your ovaries, yeah, estrogen production, et cetera. So the question is when women have a BRCA mutation, is it the ovaries that, and the tubes that come out or is it just the tubes? So there's actually a trial randomizing BRCA patients to you know, standard, which is removing both versus just removing the tubes with monitoring. And I so. imagine, you know, if you have the BRCA1 gene, that, that's got to be really stressful. Yeah, everybody sort of handles it in different ways. Um, the, you know, the ultimate risk reduction and prevention would be prophylactic mastectomies. Depending on sort of other comorbidities, um, you know, smoking history, diabetes, those kinds of things, we can oftentimes um, do those with immediate reconstruction. We often will try to do nipple sparing mastectomies where you place incisions in a, pl in, in a location where you can get all the breast tissue out, but you preserve the nipple areolar mm -hmm. complex. Mm -hmm. So the skin envelope is the same, right? but what's filling that envelope is different. And, and reconstruction really comes in two buckets. There's what we call autologous, um, which means you're using some of your own body to reconstruct the breast. And then there's implant-based reconstruction. And again, a highly personalized conversation with sure. a plastic surgeon so that we can help understand what the goals are, both short and long-term. Okay. Um, so those are the things that you would, you would walk through um, with somebody. But okay. I would establish with at least somebody who is well-versed in those mutations, because mm -hmm. we talk about BRCA in the terms of breast cancer, but there's also increased risk of ovarian cancer. And, and with some of these other mutations, there are increased risks for other cancers that you also have to monitor for. Okay. So. We have another question here. It's, it's, it's coming in as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can a younger woman diagnosed with breast cancer safely become pregnant and breastfeed after treatment. That's interesting. Yeah, uh, it's somewhat of a loaded question, okay. um, but I think it's a very, it's a good one. Um, for women who are younger, who want to preserve their fertility, you, when we first meet them, one of the things that we'll try to do is send them to talk to a reproductive specialist, mm -hmm. um, just so that way we've got an understanding of you know, where they are and, and what measures that we can take. Um, if you've had breast conservation therapy, meaning we save the breast and we radiate it, and let's just say it's one side, you can certainly breastfeed off of the other side. So for example, if you've oh, got okay. a left breast cancer, breastfeeding out of the right breasts will be very easy. Yeah. I know you'll get much milk production on the left side because of the radiation therapy, yeah. but you certainly can nurse from the opposite side. Whether or not or when, more importantly, to get pregnant, 
um, is a really a conversation between that woman and her medical oncologist. At what point, you know, what kind of cancer was it? Was it a estrogen and progesterone receptor positive cancer? So was it hormonally based or was it not? And some of those decisions depend on what type, subtype of breast cancer. Yeah, because when you're pregnant, everything grows faster, right? Yeah, there's just mm -hmm. so many hormonal changes that happen. Yeah. And there's emerging, I think the original thought was no. Um, and there's data that's now starting to creep up that says it's probably safe. Um, that's great. But, but again, know. a very personal and detailed conversation with the medical oncologist. Sure, sure. So um, when people are watch people that are watching this, um, What's the most important thing you want them to know or remember about uh, breast cancer? Uh, so I would say there are a couple of things. Okay. Um, I think screening is extraordinarily important. I know since COVID has happened, there have been some struggles, um, a lot of concern through 2020 about coming in and with the potential exposure. We are seeing the downstream effect of not having a lot of screening in 2020. Mm. So. Um, a lot more callbacks because there aren't comparisons. Um, and then, you know, anecdotally, a little bit more advanced tumors at presentation as opposed to screen detected. Now, you know, we are seeing palpation detected or, um, oh, okay. you know, patient detected or uh, physician detected by exam. So screening is really important. And if COVID has taught us anything, I think preventative medicine has been top of the list in that uh, so I think screening is very important. I think you, a woman who gets a, or a man who gets a breast cancer diagnosis really needs to have a team around them that they're comfortable with, that helps them make decisions. Um, and that, you know, a multidisciplinary approach um, for the most part is probably the, the best way to go. I'm a little biased, because that's how we practice. Sure. But, but having not just me see you, but we also have medical oncology and genetics, if appropriate, and plastic surgery, radiation oncology. We bring in nutritionists whenever necessary. We have social workers, and, and every patient sort of is discussed in a multidisciplinary fashion where we actually look at your cancer up on a big screen together, and we look at your pictures, and we make sure that what we've seen and what we've diagnosed is all that's there so that we can make the best sort of plan moving forward. And, and it takes into account, you know, some of the socioeconomic stressors of certain patients. Um, so we have roughly 30 people that attend those tumor boards that range from physicians, social workers, nurses, clinical trials nurses, so that we're all thinking about you and making and that's sure that's a that big team. That's a big it's team a big approach. Team. Mm -hmm. It's a big team. Um, and that's what you deserve. I'll yeah. be honest with you. So I think that's what everybody diagnosed really deserves is having as many people think about all aspects of care. You had asked about survivorship. You know, we think about survivorship as actually starting at diagnosis and moving forward. And there are different phases of survivorship. There's sort of active treatment and then there's long-term survivorship. And the needs of patients are very different at different oh, phases. Yeah. So having somebody around you that understands there are going to be stressors that are different at different points in your care and mm -hmm. having people to address those when necessary. So don't put off your screenings. Mm -hmm. Don't put off your screenings. Nope, don't put off your screenings. I think that's going to be super important. I think it's good. It's, it's important to know that the average woman, it's 12% risk. And so there, you know, not everybody needs an MRI. Not everybody needs to start screening at a at a young age right. um, but being you know conscious and kind of smart about it is is wise and at some point i probably won't have a job in the breast cancer we world hope so <laughs> and i, I we think hope so we're great. rooting all we're all rooting yep, for that you know it, right <laughs> yep i agree if, you know if, if and when it's my turn you know it would be nice that that's continued to evolve so that we sure. understand that we're doing as much as necessary, but not more than what's necessary in sure. order to take care of you. All right. So. Well, thank you so much. You really helped us. To, I mean, gave us a lot of good information to use here and to share. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. It was great having you. Yeah. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of Tuesday Talks. If you're looking for more information about breast cancer, you can always visit wvumedicine.org cancer. 
We'll see you on the next Tuesday Talks on November 16th when we'll talk about reproductive medicine and fertility. I'm Mary Ravazio Menard, and on behalf of Dr. Hazard Jenkins and everyone at WVU Medicine, thanks for joining us.